Hello and welcome to the Federal Society's virtual event. This afternoon, May 31st, 2022, we discuss due process protections and agent, agency enforcement actions and give a litigation update on polyweave packaging versus Buttigieg. My name is Ryan Lacey and I'm an assistant director of practice groups at the Federalist Society. As always, please note that all expressions of opinion are those of our experts on today's call. Today, we are fortunate to have an excellent panel moderated by Beth Williams, whom I will introduce very briefly. Beth Williams is a board member of the United States Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board. Prior to this, Ms. Williams was the Assistant Attorney General for the Office of Legal Policy at the United States Department of Justice. Ms. Williams also served as Special Counsel to the United States Senate Committee on the Judiciary, where she assisted with the confirmation of Chief, Ju Chief Justice Roberts and Associate Justice Alito to the United States Supreme Court. Ms. Williams graduated from Harvard College magna cum laude and earned her law degree from Harvard Law School. After our speakers give their remarks, we will turn to you, the audience, for questions. If you have a question, please enter it into the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen, and we'll handle questions as we can towards the end of today's program. With that, thank you for being with us today. Beth, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, and thank you, Ryan, for the introduction. Uh, we've got a really interesting webinar today, and I'm happy to be here to moderate the panel. Uh, let me start by giving a brief overview, and then I will introduce our speakers. In February of 2019, then General Counsel of the Department of Transportation, Stephen Bradbury, issued a memo known as the eponymous Bradbury Memo that addressed concerns about civil enforcement abuse at the agency. Parts of the memo were subsequently made into binding Department of Transportation rules. DOT asserted that these rules were designed to protect the due process rights of those who were the subject of DOT enforcement actions, including a requirement that the agency disclose all exculpatory evidence to those targeted by civil enforcement and the prohibition of so-called fishing expedition investigations without sufficient evidence to support a violation. On April 2nd, 2021, DOT rescinded these rules without the opportunity for public comment. Thereafter, Polyweave Packaging Inc., a company that had been issued a civil penalty order by DOT over alleged regulatory violations, filed suit against DOT, claiming the agency violated its due process rights by revoking the Bradbury Memo rules. The U.S. District Court for the Western District of Kentucky ruled in favor of the Department of Transportation. The case has been appealed to the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals, and oral arguments were heard on May 5th, 2022. With that, I'd like to introduce our distinguished panelists. First, Steve Bradbury served in the Trump administration as the Senate-confirmed General Counsel of the U.S. Department of Transportation from November 2017 until January 2021. As the department's chief legal officer, he oversaw all of DOT's rulemaking and enforcement actions. During his time at DOT, he also served as the acting deputy secretary of transportation and briefly as the acting secretary of transportation. During the Bush 43 administration, Mr. Bradbury served as the principal deputy and acting assistant attorney general for the office of legal counsel at the US Department of Justice. As the head of OLC from 2005 to 2009, he advised the president and the executive branch on a wide range of constitutional and statutory questions and received the Edmund J. Randolph Award and the Secretary of Defense Medal for outstanding public service, among other awards. Aside from government service, Mr. Bradbury has been a litigation partner at Kirkland and Ellis LLP and at Deckert LLP in Washington, DC, where his practice focused on regulatory enforcement and investigations, rulemaking and judicial review of agency actions, appellate cases, and antitrust matters. Mr. Bradbury clerked for Justice Clarence Thomas on the Supreme Court and for Judge James L. Buckley on the DC Circuit. He graduated magna cum laude from Michigan Law School and received his BA from Stanford University. Also with us today is Shang Lee. Shang is litigation counsel for the New Civil Liberties Alliance and is representing the plaintiff Polyweave in the current litigation. Prior to joining NCLA, Shang served as counselor to the administrator of wage and hour at the US Department of Labor. In that role, he led numerous efforts to remove or simplify unduly burdensome regulations. He has also worked in the private sector as a litigation associate at Pelknap, Patterson, Belknap, Webb and Tyler and at Kirkland and Ellis. Shang is a graduate of Johns Hopkins University and Yale Law School, where he was managing editor of the Yale Journal of International Law. After graduating law school, Shang served as a law clerk to one of my favorite judges, the Honorable Danny J. Boggs on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit. Thank you both so much for being here and for giving us some insight both into this case and into the rules themselves. So now we'll proceed with the standard order. Each speaker will provide brief statements, and then the speakers will have a chance to engage each other before a few questions from me. 
Then we'll open it up to questions from those listening. So please, as Ryan said, feel free to type your questions in the Q&A function and we'll try to get to as many as we can. So with that, let me turn it over to Steve. Beth, thank you so much for that introduction. It's great to be here. I always love being on FedSoc uh, webinars. As Beth mentioned, I was general counsel of the Department of Transportation under Secretary Elaine Chao during the Trump administration. It was a great privilege of mine to serve in that capacity. Department of Transportation is one of the principal regulatory agencies of the federal government. It has responsibility, very broad responsibility over safety and consumer protection in a number of transportation sectors within the US economy. It has a number of subcomponents uh, which have regulatory authority primarily over safety of different transportation modes or systems. And they have very broad authority to conduct investigations, issue rules, uh, bring enforcement actions. Um, they include uh, the Federal Railroad Administration over railroads, the Federal Aviation Administration over the aviation system, uh, Motor Carrier Safety Administration, which addresses the safety of trucking operations, National uh, Highway Traffic Safety Administration, which focuses on the safety of motor vehicles and motor vehicle equipment manufactured for sale in the US. And then an important uh, component of DOT that uh, isn't always uh, top of mind for a lot of folks is what's called PHMSA, the Pipeline and Hazardous Materials Safety Administration. That's the component uh, that uh, engaged in the enforcement action at issue here with the Polyweave case. And let me just say, except in certain minimal respects, I'm not going to comment on the merits of the polyweave litigation. I'm not going to comment certainly at all on the merits of the underlying enforcement action uh, involving polyweave. Um, but because DOT is such a heavy regulatory department, uh, the Department of Transportation is kind of front and center uh, in the Trump administration's priority policy emphasis on regulatory reform. And uh, so we had a big role to play in uh, putting in place the new procedures that President Trump had announced in some of his early executive orders on regulatory reform, focused on regulatory reform. And um, we're very active in that area, very proud to take a leading role as general counsel in that effort. And as part of that, beginning really in 2017, coming into office, uh, one of my big focuses was on a, a, a range of regulatory reform efforts. Um, it really had three parts. I announced it internally to our staff uh, across the department, all the lawyers in the department in 2017. We worked throughout 2018 on this effort, culminating in three actions, uh, action documents that I signed for the department. Uh, one having to do with the rulemaking procedures at DOT to kind of put in place and codify all of the regulatory reform structures and review processes we had initiated to try to improve the, regula the regulatory, the rulemaking process, including uh, enhanced uh, accommodation for public input into uh, costly rules and uh, and in instituting for the first time a guarantee that the Secretary of Transportation would have to review and approve every rule, both significant rules and non-significant rules with certain a number of uh, exceptions that the department would uh, initiate. Uh, we then also took on the question of guidance documents, the review, the clearance, and the use of guidance documents. Both of these efforts were consistent with policy focuses of the administration, certainly the President's regulatory reform efforts. You've also probably heard of the Rachel Brand memo as Associate Attorney General having to do with guidance documents. We wanted to ensure that guidance documents would be transparent to the public, that uh, agencies would not use guidance documents to expand legal obligations of parties, and that the government and enforcement actions would not rely on guidance documents to uh, expand the legal obligations of parties or try to prove a legal violation. The third area I wanted to focus on would be reform uh, of the enforcement process. Um, you know, agencies can run with the ball in rulemaking and they can try to expand rules through the improper use of guidance documents, but then they can also try to expand their authority uh, through enforcement actions. 
And some agencies have been known to do this in the past where uh, enforcement actions are used to, in essence, expand the perimeter of what the legal obligations are for parties out there in the private sector, and sometimes even settle an enforcement action against one party uh, in a manner that purports to create legal obligations binding on other parties, third parties. Um, and so kind of getting a handle on enforcement actions and ensuring that they're conducted in a way that guarantees due process for regulated entities was also a high priority in the sort of the third component. All three of these components resulted in action documents that I signed for DOT. Two of them I signed in December of 2018. One on the one was an order on behalf of the secretary setting forth comprehensively our new regulatory procedures for notice and comment and analysis of rules and approval of rules. A second was the use and clearance of guidance documents. And then the third, which I signed in February of 2019, it was intended to guarantee due process and fairness in enforcement actions. That's the memo that is now referred to here is the Bradbury memo, I actually have a copy of it. And um, it really goes through soup to nuts, uh, aspects of due process and fairness in enforcement actions brought by uh, depart components of the Department of Transportation. And basically due process is mainly making sure that parties understand what their legal obligations are, understand and have notice of an alleged violation or a, su a suspected violation. They understand what the agency's findings are and conclusions in an investigation. And then they have an opportunity to respond in a meaningful way to any alleged violation and, and be heard on that violation before penalties uh, are assessed. Um, and so the memo goes through those basic principles and ensures that uh, the agency operates fairly, that there's notice given, parties have an opportunity to respond, that there isn't bias or conflicts of interest in, in the proceedings, um, that uh, when, the agency conducts inspections or investigations. Um, it, uh, to the maximum extent possible, uh, promptly discloses to the affected parties what it's finding in those investigations, what its conclusions are, preliminary conclusions. We also ensure in here there's a clear legal foundation for the enforcement action before it begins. And if the agency is seeking monetary penalties, for example, through administrative procedures rather than going to court, we, we, we made it clear there has to be a clear authorization in statute for that kind of action. And I'll tell you kind of what prompted that, what prompted th this whole this whole reform uh, memo on enforcement actions was, was my idea for DOT. And what, what really initially prompted it was hearing about something that occurred during the Obama administration where NHTSA, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, uh, published a notice of proposed rulemaking where it proposed to authorize itself, in effect, to bring uh, administrative enforcement actions for monetary penalty. And there's no grant of authority in NHTSA statute in, uh, for NHTSA to do that. And they had proposed that rule in the Obama administration without review by the general counsel's office at DOT, without approval from the secretary. They didn't have those procedures in place at that time. NHTSA then with, withdrew that notice of proposed rulemaking. But later, the inspector general was reviewing the safety procedures of the components of DOT and had a draft uh, recommendation in his report that NHTSA should reinstitute that rulemaking and it was, uh, it was evidence of a bad safety culture at NHTSA that they had withdrawn that rule. And I had to go down and have a discussion with Cal. Uh, the, uh, he was actually very good inspector general, but I had to explain to him, look, as general counsel, uh, I would have to say NHTSA doesn't have this authority. It's not in their statute. If you make that recommendation, I'm going to have to disagree with you. So they pulled that rec recommendation out of their, uh, of their report. But this, this incident prompted, in my mind, a need 
make clear to all the components of DOT that you, you can't bring enforcement action, certainly for monetary penalties to administrative proceedings without some clear uh, legal authority and statute. So we make that clear in, in the memo as well. Um, there are a number of other aspects uh, to it, uh, two that, just two I wanna highlight. One, we made it clear that agencies and enforcement actions are not to use doctrines of judicial deference like Chevron or our deference as an excuse or device to expand the bounds of the agency's authority. Um, also, we put in place a policy that the agencies would use in effect the Brady rule that comes from criminal law uh, authorities of the, of the Supreme Court, that if there's evidence that's favorable to the regulated entity that's discovered in the enforcement investigation, that the agency will voluntarily disclose, affirmatively disclose that favorable evidence to the regulated entity uh, as an analogy to the Brady rule. This was something new. This is not something agencies do uh, typically. And uh, we thought it was a just a good common sense sort of principle uh, that we would adopt as a policy matter to help ensure fairness uh, in, um, in enforcement actions. Um, and also, of course, we've made it clear that you're not going to use guidance documents as a basis for enforcement actions. Guidance documents are auditory, they're recommendations, they're not uh, independent legal obligations. And then we made it clear that you're not going to use settlements or consent orders to try to impose new regulatory obligations on third parties. And certain certain actions would require the personal approval of the general counsel. So to put these policies in place, we undertook a pretty rigorous review process within all the components of DOT to, to comment and have input on these documents. And we also had review from the secretary's office from OIRA over at OMB, the Office of Information and Regulatory Analysis that approves major new rules for the executive branch on behalf of the White House. So there was a lot of input internally. Uh, we put them in place as new procedures um, uh, that we would follow uh, internally. So uh, these are not the kinds of uh, policy statements that require notice and comment to put in place. But we did take the extra step in the end of 2019 of codifying all of these in uh, a rule, as Beth mentioned, which was published in the Code of Federal Regulations to make it more formal, to institutionalize it, and frankly, to make it a little more difficult for the next guys to pull it back, uh, assuming they would, would wanna do that. Well, they went ahead and did that last year under uh, Secretary Buttigieg for the Biden administration. And let me just say, I was very disappointed, disheartened uh, that they did it in the way they did do it. They did it just very abruptly, without notice and comment, uh, without a lot of deliberation. And what they did was they pulled back very dramatically on the rulemaking reform procedures um, because they had undone President Trump's uh, rulemaking reform uh, executive orders. They completely revoked the policy on guidance documents, use and clearance of guidance documents, and they completely revoked this uh, memo uh, and these rules in, from the CFR on enforcement actions. And the excuse they gave was basically the COVID emergency, but also we don't like Trump, so we're gonna undo all of Trump's executive orders. And because this references some Trump executive orders, we're gonna, we're gonna completely pull it back. And we're gonna say that the COVID emergency makes it necessary for us to streamline our procedures or what have you. There really isn't any satisfactory explanation there as to how undoing procedural protections and extra steps in enforcement actions is needed to address the COVID pandemic emergency. So there doesn't seem to be a connection between A and B. Uh, so I was very disappointed. I frankly thought they would pull back some of these things like the Trump two for one on regulatory reform and some of those which we understood they would disagree with as a policy matter. But I thought they would do it in a more considered and careful way. And frankly, I was pretty shocked that they would just completely eliminate procedures put in place to try to enhance the fairness and transparency 
enforcement actions. Can't quite understand what the positive <laughs> uh, policy purpose of doing that uh, would be. So uh, uh, I've gone on much too long, but with that, let me turn it back to you, Beth, or over to Sean. Thank you. Thanks so much, Steve. Um, Shang, do you wanna make a few remarks? Yes, please. Um, thank, thank you, Beth. And uh, thanks to the Federal Society for hosting this, uh, uh, this event to discuss this important case. And of course, thank you, Steve, for writing the regulations um, and the memo that uh, made this all possible. Um, to start, I just want to uh, introduce uh, how the Polywe versus Buttigieg case got started. And in fact, uh, as, as Steve mentioned, it it's involves an administrative enforcement action uh, at, its, at its heart from uh, FIMSA, which is the Pipeline and Hazardous Materials Safety Administration. And uh, the case has, in fact, uh, spanned three, yeah, three presidential administrations. Uh, Polyweave is a small Kentucky-based company that uh, makes packaging um, that's used to transport uh, hazardous materials. So it's, so it's regulated under FIMSA. Uh, and it was in 2015, that was under Obama's administration, that uh, FIMSA inspectors, um, you know, in, toured Polyweave's facilities and, and alleged that well, maybe there's some um, some regulatory violations. So they waited until December of 2016 before uh, sending filings, uh, sending to Polyweave some charging documents um, alleging um, knowing the statute requires, you know, requires a proof of uh, knowing violations of these regulations before civil penalties can be assessed. So there was a charging document for that. Um, Polly went back, went back and forth through informal proceedings through 2017, and there was just no decision for a really long time. And it was in 2019, then as Steve mentioned, his, uh, uh, his memo came out and was codified into regulation in later in 2019. And again, Polly Weave just sat around waiting for a decision until February, 2021. So I don't know, it's four or five years later, um, it got a, an adverse decision from FIMSA and uh, decided at that point, um, the, the Bradbury regulations uh, protecting due process in enforcement proceedings were in place. So Polly, we've thought, let me appeal this to the FEMSA agency head. And it did so in March, 2021. Just a few weeks later, the, all those regulations uh, protecting due process were rescinded. Um, and as Steve said, you know, without so much of an explanation. Um, and Polly, we was especially uh, interested in, um, in uh, the, the right to discover exculpatory evidence in the agency's possession and made that a center point of its, um, its um, challenge, which was filed in district court in Western Kentucky. Um, it was, so the, the agency filed a motion to dismiss, not surprisingly, but during the briefing period of that motion to dismiss, uh, Polly, we've kept on asking the agency, hey, we think you have exculpatory evidence in your possession that you have not disclosed. And the agency, you know, in the middle of the briefing period, actually filed a notice to the district court saying, actually, we were mistaken. We did actually discover um, some exculpatory evidence that was never disclosed to Polyweave in that five-year period when we were investigating and um, prosecuting Polyweave. Uh, and that exculpatory evidence came in two tranches. The first is a 600-some page draft inspection report um, that, uh, that, was, that was never disclosed. And the second is a, a, a tranche um, included a couple of uh, inspection reports of customers who were using, customers of Polyweave, who are using Polyweave's products and shipping those products. And the inspection reports showed that uh, the customer's use of Polyweave's bags to ship hazardous material through commerce across state lines um, was not a violation of any law or regulation. And, and so Polly, we believes that, um, you know, that shows that you know, if these guys use of our bags, you know, didn't violate any laws, how could our uh, sale of bags violate any laws? Um, so based on that, um, you know, Polly, we uh, was alleging it was uh, forced to undergo an administrative proceeding where the due process rights it believed it had when it filed its appeal were uh, rescinded. Um, the, so this, this raised a couple of interesting issues. So one of them is actually uh, closely related to something the Supreme Court granted cert on recently, and that is because the, uh, um, the, there's a, the, the 
there's a statute that requires all final agency actions, um, enforcement actions to be directly reviewed by the Court of Appeals. Uh, and there's a question of whether probably we could have you know, filed in the district court before the final enforcement action was, uh, was concluded, uh, essentially a collateral attack on, on the enforcement proceeding based on Polly Weave's allegation that I was injured by being forced to undergo that. And the Supreme Court actually granted um, cert in a couple of cases, including one of NCLA's cases um, just a few weeks ago on, on this kind of interesting question, which is sort of beside the point a little bit. Um, but ultimately, the district court agreed with us and, and on that point and said uh, the district court was the proper place to file this, uh, this challenge against the rescission of Steve's regulations. But the district court disagreed with us that we suffered um, an injury um, and, and held that a uh, couple of things that uh, that uh, there's, it wasn't clear that the documents that the agency um, was withholding or were belatedly turned over were exculpatory uh, in any meaningful manner. Uh, we disagree with that and appeal to the Sixth Circuit, arguing that, you know, at least at the motion to dismiss me stage, we're entitled to a favorable factual inference. Um, the district court also said, well, maybe this thing, you know, there's no injury at all because all the documents, um, all, you know, these documents have been turned over. Um, we again appealed that issue as well to the Sixth Circuit. Um, the district court also thought maybe it's not addressable, redressable because the, um, uh, because, you know, Polly, I'm sorry, the agency did not give these documents to, um, to Polly Weave, even when uh, between 2019 and 2021, when the uh, exculpatory rights uh, were in place uh, under Steve's regulations. Um, and, and finally, the, the uh, I'm not going through all the issues, but these are kind of the highlights of the district court's decision. Finally, the district court said, you know, um, even, even if probably we were injured, um, the agency was well within its rights to uh, rescind these regulations because the, the, in these enforcement regulations are completely committed to agency discretion and not reviewable um, by any court. Um, and, uh, and based, and of course, we, we appealed that to the Sixth Circuit as well. So that district court decision was um, in September 2021. 20, uh, we filed a notice of appeal in October. Uh, an interesting twist to this case is that uh, within a few weeks of our um, notice of appeal to the Sixth Circuit, the uh, FIMSA, the agency, uh, issued a final uh, enforcement order against Polyweave in that case, uh, in the underlying administrative case, um, you know, fining Polyweave for the alleged uh, regulatory violations. Um, it was interesting because uh, at the time there was no FIMSA administrator and a final agency order is generally supposed to come from an agency administrator. Uh, what this allowed, this final agency order allowed us to actually file a second uh, case against Polyweave, a second challenge that uh, under that direct review statute I talked about earlier for direct review of final agency orders. Uh, and we raised a number of arguments in that second um, challenge, which is, goes directly to the Sixth Circuit as a petition for review of agencies uh, action. Uh, there we, we filed, you know, our, our challenge was, we filed different, we asserted different arguments from the rescission of, of, uh, of these uh, due process rights, um, including um, the fact that the final agency order was was uh, issued by a career civil servant rather than um, someone accountable to the president, and um, that uh, the just a general um, challenge against the adjudication internal adjudication process in the agency for not providing things like jury rights, um, which the Fifth Circuit recently recognized as uh, as constitutional required a few weeks ago in uh, Jarkasi v. SEC. Uh, so we had uh, so. Interestingly, we had these two kind of parallel cases um, under coming from you know the same two parties and uh, based on uh, you know substantially similar you know facts in, in the underlying adjudication. Uh, the first case, uh, which involves the rescission of the due process regulations, including the rescission of um, you know the, the regulation pr on promising exculpatory evidence, uh, had oral arguments as as Beth uh, mentioned in May. Uh, and there, the panel uh, was especially interested in this question of whether uh, the case should have been filed in the district court or the uh, or should have been should have been filed directly in you know in the court of appeals under the direct review statute. So that's a kind of a, a jurisdictional question that we hope um, 
will be resolved in our favor. And, and you know, certainly we hope in the, in the pending review in the Supreme Court, they'll resolve that in our favor and say collateral attacks against um, agency adjudications can be filed directly in the district court. Um, so that's that's sort of the background of where the case is. Um, you know, obviously, I, I, I don't want to get into kind of strategy of how things will go moving forward, um, but happy to, you know, discuss um, what, what has happened in the past. Great. Thank you so much to both of you. So I want to just give you a moment um, if you want to uh, ask questions to, to each other. I know uh, when you're doing a litigation, it's always um, exciting to be able to speak with the author of the regs and the memo. Um, so do you, do you have any questions for each other? Uh, yes, uh, if you don't mind, Steve. Um, I uh, So one, one issue that arose in the Polyweave litigation is that in the memo and in the December 2019 regulation, uh, there was some boilerplate language at the very end uh, saying, you know, hey, don't rely on any of this. None of this is, is enforceable. Uh, do you have a sense of, um, you know, what the intent of that language was designed to, uh, designed to do? Um, why was it included? Yeah, it is boilerplate language that you see in executive orders, for example. Um, and when we put in place the internal procedures as a policy matter, this was intended to, uh, certainly I would intend to enforce it as general counsel on all the attorneys uh, in the Department of Transportation, um, but it was not intended to create new rights that could be enforced in court by parties. It was intended to be basically an instruction manual for our internal use on how to uh, uh, proceed with enforcement actions in a way that would improve the process in terms of fairness uh, for, for the parties involved. Um, and we included the same in the Code of Federal Regulations uh, because again, we did this without notice and comment because these are internal procedures binding on the department internally. Um, but I recognize that there's a question about uh, whether that is truly the way a court uh, in a particular dispute or case involving a private party with property rights or liberty interests uh, would uh, address that question. And so um, I, I readily acknowledge that once we publish it in the Code of Federal Regulations, there's at least a stronger question there as to how a, a court might interpret that and apply it. Um, I, uh, I noticed in reading the district court's opinion that it was not, at least not a significant focus of the district court's uh, discussion. And um, uh, I gather that's because the court was, first of all, the court was addressing standing uh, and, and sort of threshold questions of entitlement to an injunction and, and standing. Um, but, um, but uh, when a party like Polyweave is claiming a loss of due process rights, there's a, there's a question there about, you know, what is the actual impact, what, what, what has been done uh, to take something away, and was a, was a process followed that uh, created a, an injury. Um, and the uh, court's going to address that, I think, as a straight up matter. Um, there's one thing, I don't have a question for Sheng, but I do have one additional just brief point I wanted to make, Beth, if that's sure, sure. Okay, very briefly. Um, and this goes again to the reasons given by the by Secretary Buttigieg and the Biden administration for uh, just completely taking away this these policies, these uh, enhanced protections that we had put in place for enforcement actions. And that's this notion that in some respect, they were prompted by executive orders from the president. And as I tried to explain with this enfor these enforcement action policies, it really was not the case. Um, this really originated internally at DOT um, in our office. Um, certainly uh, due process and enforcement actions was a priority for Don McGahn, the president's White House counsel in the early part of the Trump administration. Um, but there was no directive, there was no mandate directly from the president as to putting in place these, these protections. Now, 
in October of 2019, before we published our final rule in the Code of Federal Regulations codifying uh, this policy, the president did issue an executive order on enhanced, enhanced, you know, ensuring due process and enforcement actions. Frankly, I think a lot of that was prompted really by what we had done at DOT and some other agencies were moving in this direction as well. Um, and you'll see from the memo I signed in February 2019 to uh, part five or part D, I can't remember what it is, part five, I think of the, of the uh, codified regulations that we published in December, there are very few changes. There are only a couple of marginal additions having to do with encouraging cooperative sharing of information with private the private industry and private parties in enforcement actions, and also ensuring compliance with the small business regulatory protection provisions of federal law. Those, those really, as I recall, are the only two aspects of the final rule on enforcement actions that we added you know, in response to that October 2019 executive order from the president. So it, it truly is disingenuous to say, well, we don't like the president's executive order, and President Biden has ordered us to remove all uh, procedures, policies, and regulations that were done in response to that, those executive orders, when that's not the case with, with this enforcement action, uh, you know, ref, uh, uh, due, fairness, uh, due process policy. So um, just especially disappointed that they, you know, used, used the cover of getting rid of the, the evil Trump executive orders as an excuse for getting rid of this uh, this policy, um, I'm glad. Yeah, I'm glad. Oh. Hi, Sorry, I'm glad you said that, Steve, because one of the issues in, in litigation is is uh, um, whether the rescission was arbitrary and capricious. And one of the defenses the government raised was, "Hey, we have executive orders backing it. It's, are the reason for why we're doing this." So I'm glad to hear. Uh, straight from the horse's mouth, that in fact the executive orders were not the the primary motivation for this uh, for this regulation, which is an argument we made, but we didn't you know we didn't talk to you at that point. Um, the in, in any event, um, I think um, the case law is pretty clear that executive orders by themselves uh, don't justify um, issuing, removing, revoking, revising regulations. Otherwise, um, you know, otherwise an agency can just bypass. Um, arbitrary and, and capricious requirements by getting the White House to file to, to you know, <laughs> write an executive order saying regulate in this way. Um, but what, but speaking to the reasons given to um, uh, to rescind the regulations, uh, the due process regulations, um, the the final rule issued in April 2021, uh, in addition to saying, oh, we need this for COVID, which I, I get you, Steve. Like, I don't, I don't understand what that really means. I don't think that's a very good argument. Um, but they also said something like, hey, we think we can provide uh, adequate protection um, in, through internal processes without these rules being codified. And in any event, uh, much of the due process protections guaranteed by the rules are already protected by, you know, by the administration, Administrative Procedure Act and the Constitution. Um, you know, we we certainly quibbled with that more than a bit by saying, well, what part of the Constitution and what part of the Administration Procedure Act do you, do you have in mind? Because maybe maybe we don't have a problem if you agree that, you know, Brady rights are guaranteed under the Constitution. Um, but do you have a sense of, you know, what um, whether sort of the, the position that internal pre-existing procedures um, provide sort of the ad adequate due process protection as as claimed in the April 2021 20, uh, rescission document? Yeah, and that's a that's a great question, Shang. And maybe I can actually ask the question a little more broadly because I think it's really important here to separate the policy from the litigation. And I understand that DOT has asserted that they have every right legally to withdraw the protections that the Bradbury memo granted. Uh, but what is their, you know, putting your best, you know, I'm the if I'm the lawyer for a current DOT hat, um, what's their best policy justification for removing those uh, regulations and the protections in the Bradbury memo? I mean, I know that they're um, talking about you know, the, the Biden's first day executive order, President Biden's first day order, suggested that the regulatory reform rules that were put in place under the Trump administration were unduly restrictive to the government 
and tied the government's hands when it was trying to redress societal ills. So um, since we don't have someone from the administration here, what what do you think would be the best policy reason uh, for defending the rescission? Well, um, enforcement agencies, administrative agencies always like to have flexibility um, in crafting rules as well as in the procedures they follow to bring enforcement actions. And if you uh, are pursuing a, you know, if you have a mandate to protect safety, um, and there's an argument that the more flexible the procedures, the more streamlined the process the agency can follow, the quicker it can act, the more protective it can be of, of safety. Um, uh, and, in doing this, putting this policy in place, we were not uh, making any kind of statement or reaching any kind of conclusion that the components of DOT had been acting uh, in a manner that was unfair to regulated entities or that uh, there had been uh, consistent violations of due process. This was an effort to enhance the transparency of the procedures to ensure notice opportunity be heard uh, that due process would be provided, and to then enhance, for example, with the Brady disclosure of exculpatory evidence to enhance the procedures followed. Um, when you pull it back, as they've done, eliminating these policies, taking them away from the Code of Federal Regulations, then basically what you're saying is we don't want the public regulated entities to see or know exactly what procedures we believe were binding ourselves to, we're following, just trust us. We'll guarantee due process. And if we don't, or if you don't think we have, well, you know, you have recourse to courts and the courts are the ultimate judge of what is a due, what due process requires uh, in enforcement actions. So, uh, you know, you'll get what, you, what you're entitled to under the constitution uh, through the courts if you feel like you've been uh, denied that. Um, and so it's uh, six of one, half dozen of the other. The difference is the, the transparency, the public statement of here are the standards, the particular components of due process and fairness that we think are important for our agency and that we're gonna, we're gonna live up to. We're gonna hold ourselves up to. And we're disclosing that in a way that, it, that ensures everybody understands the field that they face in an enforcement action. And then the disclosures and affirmative duties that we put in place in these policies would enhance that and, and just improve uh, the, actually imp improve the accuracy of the enforcement actions that come out the door at the end of the day, and therefore truly improve safety results for the American people, we, we thought. And I guess the current administration thinks, well, Maybe because of the pandemic or just because of uh, acute needs we have for safety or whether it be environmental justice or equity or whatever their policy emphasis might be, we think we need to move quicker in a more streamlined way. We can't be bothered going through all these extra steps of disclosure and process. Uh, just inhibits our ability to uh, do what we want to do. Uh, and we're good people acting in the best interest of the American public, so you shouldn't be concerned about that. You still have your day in court, Jen. So, uh, well, that's, so, what, uh, so that's what they. That's what they would. Yeah. Uh, so about. after after yeah. over. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just asking if you had something to add, Jen. Yeah. So after a year of of litigation, I, I still don't know, and the government hasn't clearly represented one way or the other whether or not, um, even though the regulations have been rescinded, whether or not the, the eponymous Bradbury memo is still in force. Um, it was on the website, I think I, I'd used the Wayback Machine, so it was on the website as of you know, 2020, December 2020, um, in, a, in a May, you know, as of May or June 2021, it's no longer on the website. Um, but there's has been also been no public announcement that it's been rescinded and, and a new, you know, new internal instructions have been given. Um, so Steve, do you, do you have a sense of, you know, what, um, what is the status of uh, that memo? No, I don't, no. Okay. 
Uh, but generally, would would uh, you know would a, would a memorandum like that still be in force or in effect or or guide decisions um, even after you know a regulation that that purports to implement it uh, get rescinded? Well, I'm not sure. Uh, you know, it, it depends. They could they could send a, an email out from the general counsel saying don't you know don't rely on that memo anymore. Uh, I don't know if that's if that's been done in some form. Um, it can, uh, you know, there are a lot of internal memos and policy statements that kind of gather dust on the shelf. You know, we did a big effort in our time at DOT to go through all of the internal orders at the department and call out the ones that were moribund or obsolete. But there's a lot that sort of stays on the books. Uh, and yet, if there isn't a process of, you know, supervision and attention to it, uh, the sub agencies of the department can kind of continue on their traditional pathway and kind of feel like they don't have to worry about it anymore. They don't have to, you know, deal with it. And uh, that that that's a tendency that agencies sometimes fall into, often fall into. Actually, I think. Um, so I don't know the answer to your question. That was actually a factual question I had too, and some of the audience might have it also. Was this a rescind and replace by the Department of Transportation? Um, the Department of no. Justice, for example, in the same, similar to Department of Transportation, uh, issued memos, the Sessions memo and the Brand memo that predated the executive order. And I think with the DOJ right. regulations, it was purely rescinding. There's no replacement yet. Uh, is that the same for yeah, you? I think that that's what you see. Um, I know I saw we had a question from someone in the audience about, well, didn't we in the Trump administration just do to the Obama administration's policies what the Biden administration has done to ours? And it's not really the case because we didn't withdraw policies that the Obama administration had put in place to ensure due process enforcement actions and replace them with what we thought were different or better policies. There wasn't such a... Uh, clear centralized policy uh, in place like this for the for the department. So we thought this was an improvement, putting putting this in place and enhancing the procedures that everyone would follow, regularizing them and ensuring, you know, disclosure, notice, due process. And the current administration, as I understand it, has just for these reasons we've discussed, announced they've just revoked it and taken it away. And so what you have is a situation before now again, where there really just isn't this kind of regularized, consistent guidance and sets of procedures that that, uh, that people follow, and um, I think that's a detriment. I think it's a detriment to the public. I think it's a detriment to the effectiveness of the department's safety enforcement. Um, at the end of the day, because it takes away from the robust, uh, fair nature of the pro procedures that are followed. And for the life of me, I can't understand why you wouldn't want to have a positive statement about the fairness and due process of your enforcement actions. And if you're going to change that statement, why wouldn't you do it in a more careful way where you analyze the particular, you know, provision by provision, like the, the Brady exculpatory thing and explain, is this something we want to continue to do and follow and say we're going to follow and hold ourselves to or not? And if not, specifically, why not? What's the harm to the public in the process of of uh, doing it? Um, but there really wasn't an effort at explanation like that, and that's what's particularly disappointing to me. And frankly, it was a bit shocking. Well, so so some of the uh, there are other agencies with you know similar, not not compre as comprehensive perhaps as this, but there are agencies with some similar rules. For instance, I think the FEC has its own kind of Brady rule. Uh, the CFTC has um, a, a sort of through its adjudication process has held Brady to be a due process requirement in its internal uh, administrative adjudications. Um, do, you, do you feel like that or any other of the, you know, maybe the reliance on Chevron and our are um, kind of non optional requirements that that constitutional due process um, requires a certain um certain of those requirements to be followed in uh, in the agency's administrative proceedings? Well, as to the Brady rule, I guess, Shang, I'm not really going to comment on, on the 
ultimate question. I saw that in your case, you know, there's an argument that uh, because penalties and enforcement actions for regulatory violations are akin to prosecutorial, to cr criminal enforcement, because they're punitive and can be punitive in nature in part, that the due process principles that underlie Brady should apply in this context as well. And I've seen that there are some cases suggesting that in certain contexts. Um, as I mentioned, when we put this in place, it was carefully written, as you see in the memo, and, and as was expressed in the CFR, not to take a position uh, or not to suggest that the agency is bound by the Constitution to do this. Because as I mentioned, the agencies had not been doing it. Uh, it had not been viewed as a due process requirement. So we didn't, we put it in place as a policy. Matter. On the Chevron and our deference point, uh, I don't see that as a practical matter being enforced by courts because, you know, Chevron and our are doctrines that speak to courts and the role of courts. They uh, express the deference that courts should uh, provide agencies to ensure that the court is not usurping the discretion of the agency as the regulator. Um, what we were trying to express here and what I strongly feel is that agencies, when they regulate and enforce regulations, uh, should not uh, just rush to the boundary of Chevron deference or our deference uh, as the outer perimeter of what they can get away with, um, but rather should make a judgment, what's the right thing to do with the facts we have? What's the best answer here? Um, but frankly, unfortunately, that is not the reality in lots of agencies. Regulatory agencies tend to rely on the deference that courts have granted as the, as the outer perimeter, the envelope of what they can do, and they will push that envelope. Uh, they'll actually use Chevron in analyzing, in formulating regulations, and they'll use our and other deference in deciding what they can do in enforcement action. I think that's very unfortunate. And uh, it might require legislation from Congress or a revision to these deference standards by the Supreme Court to, um, to help, you know, address that issue. We tried to do it uh, here, and uh, I think it's the right, you know, the right thing to do. So we've got one question for Shang and then uh, two questions from the audience. So for Shang, what do you say to the argument that if DOT were granting rights to third parties initially, it had to go through notice and comment initially, and then not going through notice and comment is really about the secretary's ability to promulgate regulations to run the agency the way he or she sees fit? So sorry, let me, if I understand that correctly, the questioner may suggest that, that um, because these regulations weren't passed with notice and comment, the rescission without notice and comment would be would somehow permitted. Is that correct? Right. I, I think, um, I think one, um, the Supreme Court has said reliance interests are really important, uh, that even if a regulation that provides binding rights was passed without notice and comment because of the reliance interest that uh, parties have in the protections provided by those regulations, um, then you know you, the, the way you, you resend them, you have to use different and perhaps more robust procedures. Um, particularly here, uh, you know, my client Polyweave uh, didn't have these regulations in 2017 when it was going through the agency's initial adjudication. And in 2021, when, when it had the opportunity to appeal, it looked and said, hey, we have these regulations that protect us. We could, you know, we could really appeal our, the, our, the bad decision that came out and, uh, and have a fair shot at uh, prevailing in that uh, appeal and relied on the existence of those regulations uh, in, in making that decision in hiring attorneys and crafting arguments uh, and to have the regulations pulled out from underneath them in the middle of their appeal um, you know, it's, it's, we think it itself, you know, um, improper and, and required, um, a, certainly a better explanation and, and likely notice and comment as well. Thanks. So question from the audience, uh, and this is to Steve. Steve, did the subpart D regulations create substantive rights? If not, can't all regulations be protected from review simply by including the boilerplate? Well, uh, I guess I'm not going to comment on 
the the ultimate question, which really is in effect the issue uh, in the polyweave litigation. And this, this kind of also goes, I see we have two questions or a combo question here, a comment and a question from Reggie Govan, who was the former chief counsel of the Federal Aviation Administration. Uh, and his first comment sort of goes to this question too, that basically because these are internal procedures, uh, that the agency can revoke them or rescind them at any time, even without giving a reason. Um, and I guess what I would say is, um, without commenting on the ultimate question, that is the question that this litigation is raising. Uh, and that is the 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 that is to say, if you put regular uh, procedural enhancements in place for the purpose of trying to improve the fairness of the process, including the treatment of regulated entities. And if a regulated entity believes it's been harmed by the rescission of those enhanced procedures, then there's a question raised as to whether the agency must act reasonably and give reasons in taking them away versus putting them in place in the, in the first place. Um, I'm not going to, you know, express a judgment on that ultimate question. Um, that's, that's it, I guess, at the merits of the case that Polyweave has brought. The district court did not reach the merits, except to say thought you didn't have a good chance of winning on that question. But Reggie also raises a, a second question about internal deliberations among inspectors and whether internal deliberations might constitute exculpatory. Uh, evidence. And I, you know, again, um, I don't want to get into too much specifics, but we do make it clear in the memo that draft documents and deliberative process materials are not part of administrative record. Um, and if it's truly deliberative in terms of expressing recommendations as to how to approach something, it wouldn't be evidence. It wouldn't be, it wouldn't be Part of the record. However, if in uh, the process of different inspectors reviewing machinery or reviewing the practices of a regulated entity, there are factual statements made about the condition of something or actions that were taken, um, it's quite possible that that factual information might constitute something that would, you know, fall within this policy of uh, of favorable to the entity that's being, you know, subject to the enforcement action and therefore subject to disclosure. Um, so I guess that's, that's what I'll, I'll say. That's great. Thank you. Shane, did you have any comments on that question? Uh, no, I'm, yeah. Well, I guess I'll, uh, so one final question with our with our last two minutes left. Um, have you considered this case in light of the Supreme Court's 2019 DACA case, DHS v. Regents, where um, there the Obama administration didn't go through notice and comment rulemaking to create DACA, but the Supreme Court held that DHS should have gone through APA procedures to rescind DACA? Yeah, we, we cite uh, the DACA case uh, quite a bit in our in our pleadings and our, our briefs. Um, and I think the the issues it's very similar in that uh, um, again it was a non uh, notice and comment um, regulation of you know in, in DACA was essentially a non enforcement you know uh, policy uh, and here it was you know what we do procedural protections in enforcement and cr it created certain expectations for the regulated community and I think the regulated community including Polyweed relied on you know relied on those expectations in deciding. Um, not only their behavior, but what, you know, in Polyweave's case, it was in the middle of an enforcement action in deciding its strategy uh, in how to uh, pursue the, you know, its, its rights in the enforcement action. And uh, when those rights are taken away without any explanation, certainly without any consideration of the reliance interests that Polyweave and other similarly situated companies have, um, then we think that's, you know, like in the DACA case, um, that would constitute arbitrary and capricious agency action. Great. Well, I think we've reached the, the end of our time. So I want to really thank Steve Bradbury and Shang Lee very much for participating today. And uh, thank all of you and turn it back over to Ryan. Yeah, thank you so much, Beth. 
On behalf of the Federal Society, I want to thank our experts for the benefit of their valuable time and expertise today. And I want to thank you, the audience, for, either, for joining us and participating. We welcome listener feedback by email at info at fed-soc.org. And as always, keep an eye on our website and your emails for announcements about upcoming webinars. Thank you for joining us today. We are adjourned.